Dr. Hox is board certified in endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism, as well as internal medicine. And today she'll be addressing a very important healthcare issue, diabetes. She also shares her knowledge with Jabsum as an associate clinical professor. So please welcome Dr. Sophia Hawks. Hi. So, yes, I realize you know Dr. Shakuma Lee. It's kind of funny. I think we're taking turns um, having our babies because I had mine last year and she's having hers this year. Um, <laughs> um, both within a month of each other, actually. So, as you heard, I, my, I'm Dr. Sophia Hawks, I am an endocrinologist, and usually the follow-up question to that is, what's an endocrinologist? Which is a very good question, because it's clearly not evident in the name. Um, so we specialize in taking care of the endocrine system, which simply is the hormone system. So we take care of things like testosterone, estrogen, osteoporosis, diabetes as a big one, we take care of thyroid, and you know, you get the, get the picture. So um, thank you for having me today to cover diabetes. You know, it's a big problem that is affecting all of our community um, and globally too, so we'll touch on that. You know, my approach to make, when I made this talk, I really actually made it very basic with the full intention of taking your questions, and so that way I can gear it more towards what you want to hear. Um, but honestly, each one of these slides could be a talk in and of itself. There's so much to know about diabetes, and there's continuing research now that every day we're learning more and more. So um, it's an ever-evolving um, area. So, you know, what we learned today, we're building on already. So we'll start. So this first slide gives you an idea of what we're dealing with in terms of this diabetes and what if some people have called an epidemic. So these are data based on, from 2015. So worldwide, we were looking at 415 people that had diabetes. And they're predicting by the year 2040, 642 million. That's pretty incredible numbers when you think about that. But that's the prediction, but it's not inevitable. With, you know, there are things we can do to prevent it, to slow it down, to keep people from developing diabetes. And we'll go through that as I, as I talk today. Um, we don't have a cure for diabetes. That is something that, you know, that is the target for research. But we do know parts about diabetes that have an impact on how it develops and what we do and how we can prevent some of those complications that go with diabetes. Now this picture gives you an idea of those who are undiagnosed with diabetes. So when you look at this, the dark purple represents greater than 10 million. That orange color is about 500,000 to 5 million. And I'll say for the US right now, they're saying about 10 to 25% of the population don't know they have diabetes. Now you'd ask, how do they not know? Well, if you have type 2 diabetes, you can be walking around with a high blood sugar and not have any symptoms, none at all. You know, it's a, it's a common thing that I hear in my practice where I, you know, I usually ask folks, so if, how did you get diagnosed? And they tell me, you know, for years, I've been going to my doctor and they've been telling me, oh, my blood sugar's borderline, oh, I have prediabetes, and all of a sudden one day, the doctor said, yep, I have diabetes now and they're kind of surprised by it. Now keep in mind, those are the folks that are actually going to the doctor. There's quite a few people who don't go, don't get their blood sugar checked, so they don't know, and sometimes they show up for the first time already having a complication, where they're having some problem with their eyes, or they're having that numbness tingling in their feet, and that's the first time that they find out. So you're, you've seen that campaign, I know I've seen the commercials for get checked, have your blood sugar checked. 
It's a great thing to do. It brings awareness to you to know whether you have high sugar or not. Now, if you have type 1 diabetes, that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different to walk around with. Um, you commonly would have some symptoms with that. You know, people feel thirsty all the time. They're peeing all the time. All of a sudden, they're losing a lot of weight. Um, or they can get extremely sick and end up in the hospital. So that one's a little bit harder, to, like I said, to walk around with. Type 2, which is the most predominant, that one, you could be asymptomatic for years. This slide shows you the amount of people who are dying from diabetes before the age of 60. That light color, that kind of mint color, is about 20 to 40 percent. That darker purple is greater than 80 percent. Now, the age of 60, this is premature death. Because when you think about what we, the estimate is for the current lifespan of folks, it's to about the mid-70s. So if you're dying before the age of 60, you're dying far before your time. And we have... This shouldn't be happening. These numbers shouldn't be so high. Because we have ways to address it. We have ways to prevent the complications. But it takes us taking that initiative to address it head on, early on. You know, and I'll um, say... I have this conversation with some of my patients, so I'm going to take a step back and say, you know, I'm showing you these numbers about the population. And um, in the U.S., there's about 30 million people with diabetes. In terms of endocrinologists, there's about 3,000. There was a um, study done in 2009 that said there was one endocrinologist for every three medical centers. That's not a lot of endocrinologists. So when you're talking about diabetes specialists, there's not a lot. So a lot of this is coming down to your primary care providers to be able to work and identify. And I work very closely with our primary care providers um, to make sure that they have the information they need. But that being said, well, you know, when somebody comes to talk to me, when I get a referral from the primary care providers, it's usually they've kind of gotten to their point of, okay, I don't feel like I can do more for this patient. You know, help me get them to where they need to be and help them get better control of their blood sugars. But I have the conversation with these, with the folks that come to see me and ask, you know, we go through, you know, what they're eating, how their um, diet or their exercise has been, what kind of medications they're on, and I really try to get a gauge for what they're ready to do. You know, some people haven't really grasped the fact that they have diabetes, so they're not necessarily ready to make those changes just yet. And which is okay, because if I don't work with the patient, then and if we aren't in that partnership, neither one of us is going to get anywhere. You know, you know, I'm sure you've heard the stories of people saying, I went to my doctor and they didn't hear me. This is what I was saying. They didn't listen. So I want to be able to listen and hear this. And so I've had patients when they come to me and they said, OK, doc, I now realize I'm coming to the specialist. I now know I need to take this seriously. Give me three months to get my stuff in order. OK, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to give them that try to do that. Because if they're telling me, I didn't understand before, but now I hear you, OK. So we do that. And I'll tell you, it's kind of mixed results when they come back in three months. Some people come back and said, I fixed things. I'm eating better. I'm noticing my blood sugars are better. I'm taking my medicines like I should. And then there's others that are like, eh, I really didn't. <laughs> I didn't do it. I need more time. And you know, sometimes it varies if I can give them the more time or not. But as we're talking, you'll kind of see, because for me, it's on that I have the ownership of knowing if we don't jump on some of these things early, then I know those complications come. So it's weighing how much time do we let you work and kind of sort things out versus when do I need to intervene. It's kind of like, you know, you see that car heading towards the cliff. You can't just let it keep going over the cliff. You want to be able to stop it and do something. So this is where that comes in. But it, I, to me, 
It's a partnership. It's you as the patient who has the diabetes, understanding where you are, what you need to do, but then us as the medical side, helping you get to where you need to be, too. This is a pretty impressive slide. This tells you how much money we're spending on diabetes. So this is treatment, this is complications, hospitalizations, it's also considering missed opportunities at work. People sick, they can't go to work, that's money that's lost as well. This dark purple is greater than five billion. Not just five billion, greater than five billion dollars we're spending on healthcare expenditures for diabetes. Could you imagine if we had better control, where else we could put that money? Um, so that's pretty incredible to me. The other point I'm going to highlight is when you look at Africa and the amount they're spending, it's not necessarily because they're doing a better job than us. It's more because of what they have available to them. Um, they don't necessarily have those glucose testers that we can check once a day or however many times. I will tell you a story. When I was a resident, I went to Uganda for a month, and I'm giving, I was at their um, medical college, and I was giving a talk to their residents and teaching them like they were a resident here in the U.S., and telling them how they take care of diabetic emergencies and checking their blood sugar. And one of them finally raised their hand and said, well, what if we can't check the sugar like that? What if we can only check it based on the urine once a day? Well, what to know about when you're checking the urine and the glucose? That's not giving you a present time picture. That's giving you something that happened hours ago. So, but they, it didn't occur to me at that time that, oh my goodness, we need to rethink how we're treating the diabetes because they don't have the resources we have. It's getting better but they're still a far way away from us in terms of what we have. Like, they have the basics in terms of medicine. We have all the latest and greatest that are coming out, all the new types of insulin, all the, you know, new pills and whatever. These guys are dealing with stuff that was first available a long time ago, first-generation meds. So this is to kind of give you an idea of um, death what's happening in terms of death for worldwide versus um, you know, some of the common things. So if I asked you, what do you think the most common cause of death is, disease-wise? What would you guess? Cancer. So I hear cancer. I heard heart. Heart disease. Heart disease affects 20 to 30 million. So they're number one. Cancer's number two, about eight to nine million. And then in comes diabetes at around five. Um, so still not a good place to be at number three. Um, glad it's not number one. But diabetes and heart disease are linked together. Having diabetes gives you an equivalent heart disease risk. Um, so another reason to make sure we're getting the diabetes addressed. Um, just on a side note, we're doing a great job with HIV AIDS. You know, the medications have come such a long way from the 80s. These folks are actually living with HIV. Fewer people are actually developing AIDS. Um, tuberculosis, or TB, is less of an issue here in the US, though actually here in the Hawaiian Islands you still see pockets of it, but we do a good job with that. And malaria, for the most part, is well controlled as well. But you can see globally who our biggest cha challenge is. So this slide comes from the CDC. The top row is um, the prevalence of obesity, and the bottom row is diabetes. And this is 1994, 2000, and 2015. So the last 20 years or so of data. And you can see, in 94, you know, we were actually doing pretty well. We had maybe about 14, 15% of people who were obese. And this is based on um, the body mass index, or BMI, being greater than 30. But as you look, over the last 20 years, now about 90% of the US 
is running where it's greater than 26% obese. That's staggering numbers here. And then you look at our diabetes rate, where really maybe we had 5% of the population that had diabetes. Now, greater than 9, maybe 10% of the people have diabetes. Now you look at this, and this is kind of an interesting parallel, and you're like, well, we're having more obese people, we have more people with diabetes. How related are they? They are related, but they're not completely linked. Because, you know, there's obese people who don't have diabetes. There's people with diabetes who aren't obese. But I think the thing to take away from this is that there's factors that are influencing both, right? There's lifestyle changes and impacts that's causing both of these things to happen. And this is actually, in my mind, an area where we can make the intervention and help to slow things down. Here's another slide that kind of looks at it a little bit different. So on the side, you have um, the percentage with diabetes versus the number with diabetes. So this is data from 1958 to 2015. And the 2017 data, as I mentioned, says we have 30 million people. Um, so you can kind of see we were steady for a while. And then all of a sudden, we start picking, picking up steam in terms of how many people are um, getting diabetes. So one of the things that I was kind of interested in is what contributes to this? And there's lots of different studies that have looked at it. But a couple of side notes I wanted to put out. You know, our first domestic microwave came out around 1955. The first diet soda was in 1952. Diet Right came out in 1958. Our first personal computer, granted, at this, it was 1975. Not a lot of people may have had it at that point, but that's when it started. The first smartphone came out in 1992. Um, we had arcade games that were coming out apparently in the 1950s, 1960s, but the home units came out around the 1970s. So you probably can see where I'm going with this, right? So the convenience factor that came out, our computers that now we all sit in front of, and, or the TVs and the kids in front of the video games. So people aren't necessarily out and about walking. We may not be doing a lot of the heavy work that we used to be, food has become a little bit more convenient than it used to, or, you know, folks used to do more from scratch. Um, and I think, I mean, it's, it's kind of a big picture, but I think these are all pieces that go into it and are kind of sending us down this path. And, but I also feel like these are also areas, I'll say are simple, but not, it's simple, but not so easy, right? We're all busy, and we want some of these easier things. And I'll admit it, I have a, a new one-year-old, and um, sometimes it's easier <laughs> to go to the microwave or pick something up from the store than to start from scratch with a child attached to your leg. Um, <laughs> so it's true, but you know, it's sometimes you know trying to work it out and figuring out how that extra effort goes the long way in terms of our health. So let's get into diabetes. What is it exactly? So your normal state. Normally, your body, glucose is the source of all your energy. Glucose in its most basic carbon form. So when you eat, this is what your body's goal is, to get it down to that glucose so, you, so your muscles and organs can use it. But glucose isn't going to go anywhere without insulin. Insulin is its body, it's, they're kind of, of a lock and key, um, they're partners together. Insulin is one of the hormones that comes out of the pancreas. Now mind you, there's more that comes out of the pancreas, but I'm gonna focus on insulin. So what happens when, when you eat something, your body senses it. It actually starts and sends out some insulin so that your body's preparing to take this in. And then, as you're digesting more and your body understands what all came in, it might release a little bit more insulin. 
but the insulin actually helps and signals to your muscles, the liver, the fat, that, hey, glucose is here. So it gets it out of the bloodstream and into the organs that need it. But when you have diabetes, the glucose level's too high. And the reason for that is something's wrong with the insulin. Whether there's not enough insulin around, that's a certain possibility, or the insulin's not working right. It's not functioning like it should, it's not sending the right signals. Um, so those are the two main problems. So diabetes isn't purely a sugar problem, it's a sugar and insulin problem. So this is, you'll hear these terms, and you probably maybe, if someone, anyone has diabetes or family members with diabetes, you've heard these terms of insulin sensitive, insulin resistant. So as I said, so the pancreas is at the top, it releases the insulin. If you're insulin sensitive, you don't need much insulin to get the job done. Need a little bit, works gets the sugar to where it needs to go. But as you have diabetes, and this is, the insulin resistant is especially the case in type 2 diabetes, you need more insulin to get the job done. And sometimes, what causes this insulin resistance? Sometimes it's a little extra weight. There's a little extra fat around, and that contributes to the resistance. Now you need more and more insulin to get this done, to get the same amount of sugar to where it needs to go. The beta cell comes out of the, um, or the islet cell is one of those cells in the pancreas that releases the insulin. So this is, you know, your normal islet cell putting out the amount of insulin it needs if it's in an insulin-sensitive environment. Then you have this excess when that insulin-resistant environment where the body knows there's still sugar or, the, you know, your pancreas is sensing, hey, there's still sugar out there that didn't get taken care of. I need to put more insulin out there to take care of it. So it's trying, pumping, pumping, pumping more. Well, over time, that poor little cell does get exhausted. Can't keep up with what the demands are. And you <laughs> end up with this kind of scenario of beta cell suicide where, you know, if it can't keep up anymore and it becomes dysfunctional itself. And you sometimes see this scenario, this, sometimes this is the tipping point where someone goes from being okay for managing their sugars to all of a sudden, nope, now the sugars are really high, now they're more symptomatic, and, and it's because at the basic level, this might have happened where the beta cells aren't functioning, you have fewer beta cells to work with, and now what is your body supposed to do? It can't compensate like it used to. So the types of diabetes, in the most basic form, we have a type 1, type 2, and gestational. You will hear nowadays something about a type 1 and a half, and those are the folks that are sort of in between the type 1s and the type 2s. I'm going to just focus on these three, um, and then we'll also touch on pre-diabetes. So your type 1 diabetics, these are the folks, their body isn't making any insulin. These tend to be folks that are diagnosed at a younger age, the kids. And um, sometimes you find it later in life, but typically they're younger. It used to be called juvenile onset diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes. We really don't say insulin-dependent diabetes anymore because insulin can be used in any of those three types of diabetes that I mentioned. So that's why we really did go away from that term. Um, and the thought, you know, we have our theories in terms of why type 1 happens. The thought is that it's an autoimmune reaction. Your body's own antibodies are attacking the pancreas and attacking those beta cells. And um, that's what causes type 1. And this is one of those things where they may have been doing fine for a while, and then they get sick. They get really sick, and that reserve they had goes away, and that's when these type 1s kind of show up as being so symptomatic and present for their diagnosis. The main treatment for type 1s is insulin. 
There really isn't any oral medication that they can take. There is um, another hormone um, that actually in the body gets releases with insulin. It's called amylin. That is also something that can be used in type 1, but you couldn't take amylin without insulin. So the basic treatment for type 1, um, people with type 1 diabetes is insulin. Type 2. This one gets a little bit more complicated. So this, maybe your body isn't making enough, or maybe the insulin isn't working so well. This one can actually get, um, be diagnosed at any age. We used to say this was adult onset, um, but now, you know, I showed you that data in terms of obesity. We have heavier children than we used to. So we're actually now seeing more type 2 diabetes in our kids. Um, so, which brings to mind why I say it can be diagnosed at any point. And we've gone away from the non-insulin dependent because at some point, these folks with type 2 may need to be on insulin, kind of like I talked about with those beta cells not working anymore. If your body's not making insulin, in, in, insulin you need to take it. Because like I showed you, you won't be able to use the glucose if you don't have some form of insulin around. But you also have other options in type 2. Um, there are oral medications, quite a few actually now. Um, diet, exercise, always key things. Um, and you know, honestly, for type 1s too, diet and exercise are important. You know, how... Um, they manage their whole lifestyle is going to be important. Um, but it's all those three, all those things together is really what you need to do. You can't just separate out one thing. And finally, gestational diabetes. Now, this only happens in women, because at this point, only women can be pregnant. <laughs> so it... Um, this is why, you know, our, uh, we check our women for um, diabetes. They, it can happen. Uh, we check between the 24 to 28 weeks. You know, that's why you have to do that oral glucose tolerance test. Once the baby's born, the diabetes should go away. But the women who develop gestational diabetes are at risk for de developing type 2 diabetes down the line. Currently, worldwide, one in seven births, the women have gestational diabetes. Now, this is, you know, important for so many reasons. One is prevention. So, you know, having been a pregnant woman recently myself, doctors are very key on looking at how you're eating, how much weight are you gaining, because that's important in terms of contributing to your... Um, if you're gonna develop this or not. We wanna know if you had a family history of it. Uh, because of the complications for both mom and baby, we really don't want our women to develop gestational diabetes. So whatever we can do to prevent this from happening, the better for both of them. So some of the complications, this, these are baby complications. So women can have very big babies who have gestational diabetes. And these are, you know, potentially your nine pounders and more. These are big babies. And when you're delivering them, they can potentially get birth trauma, whether it's shoulder damage or other issues. When they're born, they can have low blood sugars, and they will have higher risk of breathing. And you're almost... Babies who are born to women with gestational diabetes are at risk for being obese, and I'd be at risk for developing type 2 down the road. So it's almost unfair to them when they're, you know, when they're born, they're already at risk for these things. So we really work to avoid this. One of the other key things, I mean, I don't want to say just once you have gestational, it's bad. We've actually learned a lot about how to treat gestational diabetes. We've learned that you want to identify these women early. You want to identify those at risk early because if you can normalize their blood sugars, you can avoid these complications. You can avoid the fat baby. You can avoid the hypoglycemia at birth. 
So, and they've learned that, you know, because of all the physiology and the hormones going on during pregnancy, that getting those women to a normal blood sugar is possible because you have the protective, oh, their protective hormones where you're not going to cause them to have low blood sugars. But it's so important to make sure that we treat them early and for the safety of both mom and baby. Prediabetes. In the U.S., about 84 million. 90% aren't aware, and we've touched on this, so I won't harp on that. So you're at risk for developing type 2 heart disease and stroke. Now, here's what I'll say about prediabetes. What well, we've learned about it, and they're continuing to study this, just because you're in this pre-stage doesn't mean you're absolutely going to develop diabetes. You can be in the pre-stage for years. You could potentially never develop diabetes. It's possible. But it doesn't take away that risk, and it doesn't take your risk away for the heart disease and stroke. Because I think the underlying thought is, you know, your metabolism is a little bit different. Um, We'll talk about more in terms of the risk factors, but there's things that happen that shift you from being pre-diabetes into diabetes. You know, I've had a couple of stories in clinic where, you know, I look at kind of the history of folks and what happens, and I see folks where their sugar control was good, and then all of a sudden they went from, you know, good control to bad. And sometimes I, I ask them, what happened? What did you do different? And most of the time, the answer is like, nothing. <laughs> I didn't do anything different. But then we talk some more. I hear, well, I retired last year. Oh, OK. Well, now you're not doing the same work that you did before, right? Maybe your job, you were doing lots of walking around. You didn't have the opportunity to snack. You actually were eating maybe you know, regular meals. Oh, okay. And then the snacking, too. It's like you realize you're at home and you're, you walk by the kitchen and you grab something. And you grab something else. Because I have folks that tell me all the time, oh, I don't eat three meals a day. But then we do a food history. And I'm like, really? You don't eat anything until dinner? Well, no, I nibble on this. I nibble on that. And you don't necessarily register it because you're not sitting down to eat it. Like I had a gentleman yesterday tell me, well, I don't really eat breakfast, but I have a bagel and a coffee. I'm like, well, <laughs> that counts. <laughs> but yeah, well, and what do you put on the bagel? That's a good question too. But you know, probably in his mind, well, breakfast is pancakes, eggs, you know, a big sit down thing, not this drive by, but a bagel still has calories, a bagel still has, you know, carbohydrates in it, and your coffee, I mean, that still counts, because for some people that is their breakfast. So getting that history is really important, but knowing and hearing that change, so when I get back to that first person that's retired, when I had a gentleman tell me that too, that he was retired, but then as we talked, more of the story came out. Well. I didn't used to take care of my father, but now his caretaker's gone. Now I take care of my father. Okay, so now in addition to you being retired, not doing what you were doing before, now you have additional responsibilities and additional stress. All of these come into play, and all of these come into how your life changes from how you're taking care of diabetes to how you're not, because even he said, I used to check my sugars all the time. No, not so much. I don't even know where my glucose meter is. Oops. But it's interesting, because this is the same gentleman who told me nothing had changed. So it's a perspective thing. And that's also where I think having the conversation, being able to talk story and hear, because that's better than me just saying, I see your numbers. This is the medicine you need. Mm, there's more to it. You got, from my perspective, I need to understand what your life is about. I need to know what treatment 
is going to fit for you and what actually you want to do. Because <laughs> if those don't match, you won't do it. And that's a prescription that we've written, paid for, and we'll sit there. Did you? Nobody warned me. <laughs> so I've hit on these already, the risk factors. And um, let me just put it up here, keep myself out of trouble. Um, family history. So that certainly plays a role, because then the, you know there's genetics at play. You know, did mom, dad have diabetes? Do your brothers, sisters? You know, I have people who come in and say, everybody has diabetes. So that plays a role. Lack of exercise. You know, not doing um, what you need to. And I'll say, you know, I have folks who come in and say, I can't lose weight. Uh, you know, I'm very active at my work. I'm doing everything. But you know, unfortunately, our bodies are smart. And it's hard for out us to outsmart our bodies. <laughs> Um, because, and this is part of like, you know, when you're trying to lose weight, you hit a plateau because your body's like, oh, hey, this is my new normal state. But same thing happens when you're active at work. Your body gets used to that. This is my normal. So if you wanted to lose weight, you'd actually have to do a little bit extra to get that going. And it's kind of the vice versa, too. So we talk about things like retirement. You go from having an active work to now I'm retired and maybe not as active. Well, somebody needs to let our bodies know because that's what they're expecting us to do. So sometimes that's why some of that little weight comes back on. So unhealthy eating, um, and I'll kind of go over this some more, and being overweight. You know, when I talk to patients about weight, it's interesting, your body tells you a lot. And I've learned this through my years of practice now that it doesn't take much weight loss to show improvement. Five, 10 pounds can make a big difference. And I mean, some people will say, well, 10 pounds is a lot to lose, but if you're losing that over you know, a few weeks to months, it's not so bad. It's not so, like saying you gotta lose 20, 30 pounds. Five, 10 pounds. That little less on your body can actually make your body more efficient. And I've seen it in terms of people's blood sugars being less and them needing less medicine because they've lost that little extra weight. Um, so let's go forward. So in these are family history, you can't change. You can't pick who your parents are. Um, so that part, we're all stuck with. But the others, well, those are areas we all can make an impact on. So how do we diagnose diabetes? The FPG refers to fasting plasma glucose. A1C is your hemoglobin A1C. And the OGTT is the oral glucose tolerance test. I'll start with that one. The oral glucose tolerance test, we don't do so commonly anymore for women to diagnose gestational diabetes. This is the test that gets done. So um, you drink this sugar drink, and you, or you go to the lab and get your blood drawn, and then an hour later they're checking your blood sugar. So you can do it for folks with diabetes, but it's a little bit more cumbersome, so we don't tend to lean on that. But for your diabetic or um, pregnant women, we do do this. And it gives you those cutoffs. So if somebody, if you're diagnosing diabetes, Greater than 200, if they cross that threshold, they have diabetes. If they're between 140 and 200, they're in that pre-diabetes range. And a normal response would be a blood sugar less than 140. And that's in response to the oral glucose tolerance test. Now, fasting plasma sugar. So this is <clears throat> if you've had an overnight fast. Your doctor tells you, come in first thing in the morning, don't eat anything after dinner, we're gonna check your sugar. These are the numbers we're gonna look at. Um, let, your sugar should be less than 100 if you're in the normal range. That in between is your prediabetes, and anything over 126 is diabetes. Now we don't base it on just one reading when we're going off the fasting plasma sugar, we usually do two two of those to make sure and confirm. 
Um, but that gives you an idea of what that range looks like. If you're between that 100 to 126, it's not normal, but it's not diabetes either. You're kind of hovering in that borderline area. Um, the hemoglobin A1C. So this test is very useful. It was only recently in the last couple of years, oh boy, um, recently um, made a diagnostic test. And so um, how this one works, though, is it's based on your red blood cell, so the lifespan of the red blood cell, because the blood cell is floating in the blood and the glucose molecules attach to it. If it's normal, you should, if you don't have much sugar in your blood, you're normal without diabetes. There shouldn't be many molecules attach, attached to that red blood cell. But if you have diabetes, it, they can all glom on and your blood could be like syrup. Um, the lifespan of a red blood cell, about 90 to 120 days. So when you're making changes or someone's making changes in their for their diabetes, we won't necessarily see that quickly within the A1C. It may take one, two months. Usually your doctor may do it every three months. That's pretty safe to see a change. Um, it's very useful in terms of being able to tell how someone's been doing. Um, like I've had folks say, oh, you know, the night before my blood test, I kind of cheated a little. That's okay, <laughs> that'll show up on your fasting test, but your A1C is going to tell me how the last couple of months have been doing. Because I've got folks who like, I've been great the last couple of weeks, but might have cheated um, otherwise. So greater than 6.5 puts you in the diabetes range, less than 5.7, you're normal. Um, she gave me the wave for my time, so let me kind of move through. So lifestyle change, I think I've hit on that quite a bit. Medications. Let me go to the next slide. There are lots of medications. These are mostly for your type 2 um, patients. I like this slide because it gives you an idea of all the areas that insulin has an impact on, and all these medications are working at all these different areas. Some are targeted differently. And, you know, I often get the question of, Doc, do I need to be on all these medicines? Sometimes, yes, because they're doing different jobs. You know, we're taking advantage of how these medications are acting and having them work together. Because uh, other than insulin, they all kind of have their different areas where they work. So I sometimes have people who are on two, three different types of medications just to t take advantage of this. So simple things when it comes to activity. People don't have to go to the gym. You can do things around the house, increase your yard work, walk around the neighborhood, use pools, use the ocean. We're so fortunate. Um, but making the time, you know. So what the guidelines say is 150 minutes of exercise per week. And per week. That's not too bad. That's like 30 minutes over five days. Um, and what they found is it doesn't have to be all in one block of time. So let's say you did 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon. Still really good. Um, one thing that they did do, there was actually a study that looked at the effect of exercise and how long it lasted on your blood sugars. And what they discovered is it's great um, beyond two days that effect of exercise starts wearing off and they notice the blood sugar starting to come up. So to me, if I'm prescribing exercise, I say you need to be doing something at least every other day, right, to help maintain those blood sugars. So I thought that was an excellent study that they did to be able to understand that. And do something that you like. You know, you're more likely to stick with it if it's something you like to do. Um, nutrition. This seems like common sense, but I know it's not um, an easy thing to do, especially when we're talking about um, people on budgets. You know, if you are only um, 
living on a few hundred dollars a month, how do you, you know, food can be very expensive. And um, how do you make these right choices? And here, especially since we're kind of subject to people shipping food in, you know, eating local, I notice we have more and more farmers markets that are happening. Um, like right now, the Kakaako farmers market is going on. Um, so that's an opportunity because the local foods tend to be a little bit cheaper um, versus some of the others. Um, so these are kind of the complications you'll see, heart disease, nerve damage, eye problems, foot problems. Um, I'm just going to move forward because I want to leave you all time for questions. You have this in there in terms of myths versus facts. The titles are all the myths. In the body are the facts. Um, I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to hit on this one. People with diabetes should eat special diabetic food. So, like, no, not necessarily. You know, some of those things they label as diabetic. It's a good marketing ploy. Um, they can make them more expensive. When honestly, eating good, wholesome food, your fruits, your vegetables, your lean proteins, your whole grains, that's what you should be eating. And... But what's important is the portions. You know, sometimes we see the label and think, oh, it says diet, it says low fat, low sugar. But we still have to look at what the serving size is. What's the portion size on that? Because just because it says it's low this, free that, doesn't mean we get to eat as much as we want. <laughs> so um, we have to be cognizant of that. And one of the, I want to, I didn't put it on the slide, but one thing I want to point out. So, you know, some of our sweeteners, they sell you they're no calorie. So I looked up Truvia and Splenda. So Truvia, for one of their servings, it says no calorie, but it actually has two grams of carbohydrate in it. So the more you add, the more grams of carbs you're getting, and which comes into play when I have patients who are like, I didn't use sugar, I used this sweetener. You have to ask how much, because it still may have some carbohydrate, it might still have effect on the sugar. Splenda, for one of those little packets, like, actually, that's sitting out there, three calories, 0.9 grams of carbs. And I'll tell you the story that prompted me to look these up. I had a patient with diabetes who was like, I don't like the taste of water, but I'm making myself Kool-Aid, and I'm adding Splenda. And I asked him how much Splenda he was using. A cup. <laughs> so a cup. That turned out to be, like, I forget, 20-some carbs or something, and it's like, okay, this is <laughs> part of the reason we're dealing with a sugar problem and why we're having some spikes when you're drinking your Kool-Aid. So the sweeteners are, I'm not going to say they're bad, but it's they, the same rule applies, I guess I should say, that portions. Portions is going to be true about everything. And I think I've put in here about sweets. Oh, a person with diabetes can't have chocolate, they can't have ice cream, they can't have dessert. No, not true. They shouldn't go overboard. If they have a healthy meal plan, to have a treat every now and then is okay. For some of my patients, if they're on insulin, I tell them, okay, you need to account for that. Because normally, if you didn't have diabetes, and you, your body was reacting normally, when you ate that piece of chocolate, it would know. And then it would release insulin to manage that. The hard thing for folks with diabetes, they have to think about all that anymore, you know, all of that. Their body's not doing that self-regulation anymore. So they have to think about it. Oh, what am I gonna do if I'm eating this much? What am I gonna do if I'm exercising this much? What's gonna happen with my blood sugars? It's a lot to process. Um, so it's a lot. And I'm going to finish with one story, and then I'm going to open you guys for questions. So to get to where I am now in terms of being an endocrinologist, so I went to med school, I went to residency, and I did um, an extra couple of years of training to be an endocrinologist. And I'll be honest, when I was a student and a internal medicine resident, 
I heard somebody coming in with diabetes, and I thought, oh, my gosh. Okay, this is going to take a lot of time. They have so many things going on. And when you're, and this is going to be similar for your primary care doctors, diabetes may be one of the five problems you have to take care of. So it's just like, oh, my gosh, all this I have to do. So my real appreciation and love for diabetes came from when I was a fellow. And I got to do really break it apart and really understand and get to dive in and say, this is what's happening with the body and understanding if we make these different changes that um, how it affects the person and realizing what strategies to help to communicate to people how to better make their lives. So um, I guess for me, I'm coming from this place of passion and love for it, and it's personal too. My dad is in that pre-diabetes, diabetes stage, and I have family with it too, so I want to see people do well. So I'm going to stop there, open it up for questions. I know I've talked a lot, so there must be. Thank you. Thank you.